I would also just be the Finance Commission was given compliance with the requirements of the Open Public Meeting Act by providing notice to all municipal and county clerks under the Finance Area and to the Secretary of State on December 18, 2014. And on to the Commission's officially designated newspapers on December 18, 2014, by posting a copy on the bulletin board in the Commission office. Thank you very much, Mr. Good morning. Good morning. Commissioner Ashman. Here. Commissioner Avery. Here. Commissioner Barr. Here. Commissioner Brown. Here. Commissioner DiBello. Here. Commissioner Erling. Here. Commissioner Galetta. Here. Commissioner Janaro. Here. Commissioner Lloyd. Commissioner Lynchy. Commissioner Prickett. Here. Commissioner Quinn. Commissioner Rowan Green. Commissioner Wicks. Here. Chair Miller. Here. Thank you. Can you all please rise and let me take a pledge of allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Years ago, whereby you do not have to do that. You can 
uh, use a crayon and put it on a napkin and give it to us and we have to accept it. Uh, so you can also email them. You, you could not do that. So what we've done here is create a new page that describes our process and what we've provided for three different ways for you to submit it. One is through our new form-based uh, system. Um, there are certain fields here that are required and all this information will go to a new OPRA uh, address so that our people have all the information. If someone submits an OPRA to a different person on our staff, we forward it to this address so we all know where it's going. So this should be uh, a benefit to us and the public. Secondly, we have a new form which we're required to have for people who don't want to do it online. They can print this out and fill it out by hand and, and mail it to us or drop it off. Um, thirdly, you can just use the email address and email us and send us your request. So there's three different ways and it should work out for us. Um, if anyone has any questions, that's That sounds great. Much easier. last commission meeting, um, there were emails coming to the record about the New Jersey Natural Gas Southern Reliability Pipeline Project. You had asked me to look into what had happened from our perspective, and um, we had um, two or three application meetings with New Jersey Natural Gas, both in 2014. Um, they filed their application with us in April 2015. And the first pre was in May of 2014, so about a year before. Um, and they came in with a number of potential routes that they were considering, um, three or four with different variations on them. The proposed routes passed through a variety of climate management areas, growth area, uh, the, millage, the, the joint base, the villages, rural development, forest, and preservation area. We reviewed with them at that meeting the <coughs> CMP requirements for each of those areas with regards to pipelines, um, where they were prohibited, where they were allowed in conditions, and where they were just allowed. Um, a few weeks after that, they submitted a revised um, route where they had eliminated any crossings through preservation area or forest where there were um, CMP restrictions on it. That application, as I said, was submitted in April. Um, and it's currently under review. We don't know who sent that email or, or, or you know, if you translate it to many different ways as you want, but from the second that we met with them, they were proposing routes through the base. Um, when they came back in October, representatives of base were with them to talk to us about that application and why a certain function of the base, which is a requirement of our rules, I have not seen the application submitted, but I you know, all of those things that have to be in the application and we make the determination of whether it's compliant with the CMP. Your representation as the staff does not recommend or propose rules to the applicant. When the applicant came in, they came in with a map with groups on it, a number of them, for us to guide them on as to what was, you know, would be consistent and what would not. It included groups through the base at that time. Just for the benefit of any commissioners who weren't here for the last meeting, there was a speaker during the public comment portion that alleged that an email had gone between uh, New Jersey Natural Gas and representatives of Joint Base suggesting that the staff had, uh, you know, alleging that staff had recommended rules for it to facilitate the installation of a pipeline. The email said that requested that some of you are rerouting the pipeline through the base. I assume that meant because it was already going through the base, but then they changed it at the bottom, and that's what they were trying to do. But I have no idea how to word it or who went to. But that's what happened here. We have the maps they came in with, everything's in the file, it's all available to the public, correspondence back and forth, us and the applicant talking about it. Thank you, Director. And then the commissioners have any questions? Good morning. I just want to report a series of uh, meetings, events of the Associated with Water Supply Planning. Uh, the State's Water Supply Advisory Committee continues to meet and does not have the State's Water Supply Master Plan. Uh, so I, I like that they're going to have it short term. Dan Kennedy came to the meeting and he said that uh, there's no news on the plan, but the department is doing planning. He said, uh, 
plan at first as well as now. This is a They started coming to the November meeting and they're going to show some of the various projects they're doing under the concept of uh, national plan. No, no, they're, they're all game. <laughs> uh, they also discussed, uh, they had just uh, designated three of these areas in the state as uh, under a watch in terms of water. water. Uh, and shortly thereafter, we had a big storm, so uh, I can go in there. Uh, but uh, uh, they went through how they designate a watch and warning and emergency and when, what's the history of those different aspects of hip hop and uh, uh, We also have a requested to come to the Delaware River Basin Commission. They have a water management committee meeting on top of the February 2nd. So Presentation on how water is managed. I'm going to do one on how to do it in the line. I might do it in the line in the future. So, uh, so and then we're having a meeting with the Builders Association that they requested to talk a little bit more about water. Based upon presentation, we'll make you uh, in the future in the EPA. When they have some comments, they agree or something. And actually, don't agree with all. So, uh, that's what I have. Thank you. Yeah. <coughs> Larry, I noticed in the minutes. Me for uh, waiting so long, but what about the builders meeting with all the PDCs? Did that take place? Uh, they, they've all been combined. They're both are going to be done at the same time. PDC and this water team. Oh, you're going to do them at the same time? Oh, yeah. That will be a long meeting. Yeah. In two hours. No, all day. <laughs> Any other commissioner? Uh, Larry, what three specific areas were trouble were considered low in this area? So it is mostly the northeast. Uh, the northwest is in very good shape. You know, the island is the northeast section of the state, almost running down on the coast. Okay. Nothing in the south, and uh, nothing in the, really in the central. That I think there were about nine different areas or something like that. Three or five. I don't know if they'll continue that. Uh, good morning, commissioners, members of the public. Just had three brief items that I wanted to touch upon. Uh, the first one is this past Wednesday, uh, the executive director and the staff met with Stafford Township. I just wanted to remind the commission that uh, Stafford Township is pursuing a waiver of strict compliance based upon compelling public need uh, for a stormwater management basin on the south side of 72. That would be the Shakers portion of the township. Uh, they are moving towards completion of that application. Uh, as your regulations require, we'll be scheduling a public hearing on that waiver application, uh, and that waiver application should be making its way to the commission. My estimate at this point would be the beginning of January. That's the first waiver of strict compliance based upon a compelling public need that the staff or the commission has seen in a number of years. The second item I wanted to mention was I had distributed a, a letter this morning to each commissioner. Uh, it's dated October the 8th to the New Jersey Department of Transportation. It somewhat, somewhat of an atypical situation arise that we had to deal with over the course of the past month or so. Uh, back in 2014, September, the commission approved a public development application for reconstruction of the dam in Winslow Township. Uh, it's called Anchor Lake. Uh, it was called Blue Anchor Dam. This is the White Horse Pike uh, in Winslow Township. Subsequent commission approval of the application as mobilization, the contract was awarded, mobilization has occurred uh, down on the site. And one of our staff members identified an endangered plant in the lake. Uh, the letter that I have to go through the details uh, of that matter. Um, it's, the plant is known as an American Lotus. Uh, there are only <coughs> several known uh, locations in the state of New Jersey. The actual dam reconstruction uh, does not impact, or the road widening of the White Horse Pipe does not impact the plant. But what does impact the plant is they'll be installing a temporary coffer dam. Uh, so they can reconstruct the dam and the roadway. Uh, so we met on site, we gathered information from the applicant uh, as to the extent of the population, and then we had to make a determination as to whether or not what was being proposed under our rules 
is going to result in an irreversible adverse impact. I'm going to use some bureaucratic words. It's important on the local population of this endangered plant. Uh, the staff concluded based on the, the number of plants that were identified and the number of plants that are going to be impacted by the temporary coffer dam that the proposed development would still meet our regulations. Um, the letter that you have in front of you advises uh, the Department of Transportation of that fact and that they can proceed with their project that had already been approved by the Commission. And two last pieces of information of note, uh, we advise uh, the Department of Environmental Protection, the Office of the Department of Environmental Protection uh, that addresses threatened and endangered plant species. You'll note in the letter uh, that their review uh, before we made our decision, they believed that the plant had been introduced into the lake, and I believe somewhere after 2006, probably telling you more than you need to know, but the, the, this plant, its seed pod, is commonly used in florist arrangements, and so how it was introduced to the lake, or why it was introduced to the lake, is really not covered by your regulations. Uh, but these were all factors that the staff considered uh, in, in reaching its determination. The last thing I wanted to know, uh, because I suspect some may ask this question, is the applicant uh, did, in fact, complete a threatened and endangered species plant survey, uh, both of the uplands and the wetland area prior to condition approval of the plant. Uh, the applicant's consultant did not identify the plant uh, in the area. Uh, this plant is known as a rapid grower and a base of species some states uh, it is an endangered plant of the state of New Jersey. So I'll be happy to answer any questions, but I just this wasn't any typical situation that we faced and I wanted to make sure the commission was aware of, of what we did and why. I have a question about what list. Is it an uh, endangered uh, species or a threatened species in, on the pine maze list or is it on the state list, uh, federal list? Uh, do you know what its status is? It's in, well, it's, in, it's a threat, it's an endangered species uh, on the commission's list, and I think I'll defer to Mr. Bunnell, who's in the back. John, do you happen to know whether this is on the state list or not? I think it is, but I'm not sure. There's a lot of friends about it. <laughs> the key was, for me, was it was it on our list. Thank you, John. And the last item I just wanted to touch upon is in, in Hamilton, we've issued a certificate of filing for a significant addition to the existing Walmart. That was a long time game process because of any number of factors. The, the duration of the application process uh, was really attributable to the fact that there was a failing stormwater management basin on the site that had to be addressed and were ownership issues. Uh, the applicant did not have ownership of that basin. And the second issue pertaining to uh, sanitary sewer flows to the wastewater treatment plant in Hamilton, and that was tied into the expansion of their land disposal site. So if those matters have been addressed, and we wish our certificate of filing for that significant expansion of the Walmart. That's all I have. Questions or comments from the commissioners? I had, I had one question. Just give me again when the staff are here. The staff are here has not been scheduled yet. Oh. We anticipate the hearing would be probably in early December. Okay, thank you. Chairman, sure. would, we, would, we, uh, would the commission see um, a summary of that before the hearing? What, what do we see before the hearing occurs? Well, it is a rather involved process. Uh, the staff would conduct the public hearing, gather the public comment, and what will arrive at the commission would be uh, the application for the waiver of strict compliance based upon the compelling public need, a summary of the testimony that was offered at the public hearing, uh, and the executive, executive director's report responding to both those comments and the executive director's recommendation on the waiver itself. So that would be the first time that the commission would see this application. Uh, and probably another piece of information more than you asked, but if in fact the waiver is approved by the commission, on the agenda subsequently will be an application for the public development approval for the basin. So it'll be, but that's continued upon it for the commission's action on the waiver application. So it's somewhat involved, to say the least. Thank you. Uh, moving on, uh, 
um, staff has recommended or I'm sorry, two resolutions regarding public development projects. The first the project is proposed by the Jersey State Forestry Service. And I hear a motion for the adoption of that resolution. So we Is there a second? Second. Okay. okay. Is there any discussion of the resolution? Okay, one in favor of this adoption, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, that resolution is approved. Uh, the next is a public development application for Woodland Township for our construction of a 1440 square foot equipment storage building and 9,000 square foot asphalt walking track and associated recreational improvements at Chatsworth Elementary School. Motion. So moved. Motion for second. Second. Motion second. Is there any discussion for this resolution? All in favor of its adoption, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? That resolution is fine. Okay, you're uh, at that point in general where you will hear public comment on agenda items and then pending uh, applications. There is one pending application from Tabernacle Township for uh, <coughs> construction of two 64 foot high emergency services radio communications towers. No one will move on. Uh, next, we have um, three ordinances from Kansas that do not require uh, our action, but uh, as is our custom, if any commissioner has any comment or questions they want to raise at this point about these resolutions, Berkeley Townships, Little Lake Harbor Township, and Ocean Township, uh, Master Plan recommendations here and now. No one will move on. We have two other resolutions. Uh, staff has produced an annual report for uh, 2014 and uh, they have provided it to us in a package and there is a resolution uh, for its adoption. We have a motion and a second. Uh, did staff want to uh, have, make any comments about this report? Did any commissioners want to make comments about it? It was a very good year. Very good report. Very good. Okay. Uh, since there's no comment, uh, all in favor of the adoption of the resolution, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, the report is adopted. Uh, next, we, we spoke uh, about this at the last meeting, and uh, the staff has put together at our request a resolution that it if you indulge me, I'd like to, to read this uh, into the record. To honor the memory of a former commissioner, Robert Hagman was first appointed by Governor James McGreevy on December 16, 2002, and served on the commission with distinction until June 12, 2008. During his tenure, Mr. Hagman served on the commission's personnel and budget committee, permanent land protection committee, and as an alternate member of the science committee. And he also served eight terms as a member of the Pine Lands Municipal Council, who serves as a sounding board between the 53 municipalities in the Pine Lands area and the Pine Lands Commission. And as a hay farmer, as the former mayor of Mulva Town, <coughs> Mr. Hagman provided a neat global perspective on farming and municipal matters during his time on the commission. And whereas during his tenure, the commission strengthened the Pine Lands Protection Program by adopting eight amendments to the Pine Lands Comprehensive Management. And whereas commission members are unpaid volunteers, and Mr. Hagman devoted hundreds of hours of his time as a commissioner, and whereas the members of the commission want to recognize Mr. Hagman's significant contributions and express their appreciation for the service that he performed, now therefore be it resolved that the members of the Pinelands Commission assemble at the J. Salt Center for Environmental Policy and Education on this ninth day of October 2015 to hereby express our appreciation to the family Lee Robert Hagen for his commitment to the Pioneers and for his service as a member of the commission between December 16, 2002 and June 12, 2008. And I hear a motion for the adoption. So moved. Second. And a second. Is there any comment on the motion? Okay, all in favor of its adoption, please say one. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstention? Any abstention? The resolution is approved. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Thank you, staff. Okay, uh, next we will be 
open to public comment. And uh, we probably have a signage. sequence of events. That, that much is fact. We know that the company said, the applicant said, that their best route was off base. When the best route is off base, when they say the best route is off base, that means that there's not a military purpose. If there was a military purpose, the best route would be on base, right? So we know that after these pre-application meetings, we know that the purpose changed because the alignment changed. Right, the route changed. So before the meetings, the pre-application meetings, we had no military route, therefore no military purpose. After the meetings, we had a military route and all of a sudden a military purpose. We and again, I don't I don't cast any aspersions on that. I simply want to state that as, as a as a pretty clear sequence of events. And then we know in response to whether or not um, an actual military purpose was found, we know that the application wound up being submitted later on after that with what the company official says were vague, insufficient, and changed purposes, a changed military purpose. They said that these vague statements were not going to be sufficient for the application. They said that they were going to be, they were too vague, they were insufficient. Yesterday, WHYY reported more information about these emails. Um, and let me just say for everybody's purposes that this is a different pipeline than the one that's proposed by South Jersey Gas. Uh, the difference between these applications is that only one, only NJNG, submitted an application that in black and white, this company official says the project purpose stated in its application to you is a fiction. They clearly state that in the emails. There's no escaping that. Sorry, you that this is the only application of the two pipelines. There's only one where you have black and white evidence. You have black and white emails from a company official that say that they were concocting a military purpose for the project, a purpose for the project that was otherwise than what, they, than what it actually was. And the other pipeline wasn't associated with this. Correct, actual. correct. So WHYY detailed that in the emails, an NJ official, NJNG, New Jersey Natural Gas official, deceitfully responded to a naval inquiry about the safety of the pipeline by withholding a common everyday calculation of its potential impact area. It also reported how the same official from the company um, wrote to military officials in no uncertain terms that the company was seeking to reroute the pipeline onto the base not for an actual military purpose but for the sole reason to gain the commission's regulatory deference for projects that have military purposes the emails clearly show that the company official bounced two different versions of a phony military purpose off joint base officials as late as when he was filling out the pylons application finally WHYY felt compelled to offer that it doesn't appear to show any illegal activity on the part of NJNG. I hate to be a party pooper, but if that is the best that can be said in NJNG's defense, then this application raises serious problems that need to be addressed. Because providing deceptive information to a public agency or public officials was illegal when it happened at the joint base, and submitting an application to the Pilots Commission with knowingly false claims for the purpose of obtaining a near total exemption from the CMP, for which an applicant knows it does not truthfully qualify, is most definitely illegal as well. I'm not a lawyer, but NJSA 2C287 says a person commits a criminal offense if he makes, presents, offers for filing, 
or uses any record, document, or thing knowing it to be false, and with purposes that be taken as a genuine part of information or records received or kept by the government. This makes sense because anybody who submits a form to a government agency signs a declaration that says all of the information provided on the form is true and that you understand providing false information to a public agency is a violation of the law. But whether or not NJNG is held to legal task, I'm sure you'll agree that an application containing what an NJN official admits is a fabrication must not be approved. Executive Director Wittenberg told WHYY that the Pinelands Commission is, quote, fairly close to finishing its review of NJNG's application, which means that it is still entirely within your power to ensure that a purpose fabricated to you is not rewarded. But your ability to act will end fairly soon. To do otherwise, to not act, would be to turn a blind eye to what the email showed to be a false application, which, by the way, NJNG did not once deny. In the entire piece, NJNG declined many opportunities to deny what the email showed. The only defense it did offer is a support letter or an endorsement letter from a former base commander, which to NJNG suggests that whatever doubts the base had at the outset had been resolved. This is wishful thinking because the letter can actually be found within, J and within NJNG's application and it most certainly does not assert any actual or specific military purpose. It merely repeats the same, quote, vague statements, which is NJNG's term, that NJNG warned in its emails to the base were not nearly sufficient to include in its Pinelands application as a justification of stating a military purpose. As a point of further interest, according to the Courier Post of September 9th, the new base commander has ordered a further review of the project. So if what NJNG calls vague statements are the best it has to support its concocted military purpose, well, I must tell you, it only further undermines the underscores the impropriety of this application in claiming a near total military exemption from the CMP. And I hope you will agree that this is a time-sensitive matter that can only be rectified now before the Pinelands Commission staff concludes its review. A deceptive application is not one that merits the approval of this agency. Future applicants must not look at this story and these emails and conclude that this agency is ambivalent about whether it, the applications applicants submit to you are truthful and the claims are not fabricated. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Mr. Good morning, Georgina Shanley of Ocean City. Um, we owe a great debt to Mr. Rasmussen for all of his research and for being such an engaged public citizen and trying to augment the information that the Pinelands Commissioners have. And I would hope that what he has brought will be looked at by the Pinelands Commissioners also, not just the staff. Because we're, we're looking at a fox guarding the check, chicken house situation and we really rely on you. And with this new application for the South Jersey gas, just with the change of word, one word, it goes from a public application to a private application. All of your power is taken away. And this is, this is really scary. And if there was such a significant change because of this one word, why wasn't there a new application submitted if it was a significant change? We're losing our grip on our, on our agencies, on our staff, and I'd like to uh, read you a quote from our chief executive, who's uh, Governor Christie, um, from the end of July, just a few months ago, at the Clinton County Hog Roast in Iowa. He said, um, he said he was very familiar with Lisa Jackson. I saw the damage she caused in New Jersey and I replaced her. We have worked to make the DEP much more business friendly transparent and more cooperative with our customers, the business community in New Jersey. So I had the experience of dismantling the business unfriendly environment that Lisa Jackson created in New Jersey. I cannot wait to dismantle it at the EPA as well. So this is a major threat and we've seen it with appointments to the Pinelands Commission. Uh, 
couple of people who voted against the South Jersey gas pipeline were removed and two people who supported were put in, much against the public interest. Um, we've had staff helping um, the South Jersey gas attorneys with the wording of the, of the MOA and also, which is even worse, that's fine. But what is worse is that the attorneys have recommended the language for the MOA for the, for the staff. And it's, it's very, very disheartening. And there has to be some accountability. We see it in Washington. We see it all over the place. But this is our little territory here. And there has to be a way. There has to be a moratorium on pipelines, on transmission pipelines. I'm not sure if the commissioners uh, can generate that moratorium or do something within even the pinelands. Because this is getting to be out of control. And uh, you're, you're supposed to serve, protect, and defend, enhance the pinelands. But it's going to be just one big developed track. We're going to, our aquifer would be in danger, and all of the, our sense of democracy would be taken away. I really hope the commissioners kind of wake up and do something. Thank you. Jeff, too. Thank you, Jeff Tittle, Director, New Jersey Sierra Club. I'm, I'm here today, uh, I think, for, for two reasons. One, we have two applications that are moving um, sort of behind closed doors without review or transparency from the public, and in the same case from the commission itself. And I think that is troubling to me, and that's why I'm here, because I want to try to get certain things on the record uh, while you know there is a chance to at least for you to hear it, uh, and, and to some case for staff. But I want to start out to say that, you know, there is a crisis in, in this country in the confidence of government. And we see it being manifested every day when you see a charlatan with a comb over leading in the polls, or where outsiders um, can block the, the will of almost every member of Congress in picking a new speaker. And, we, and it's not because these people necessarily um, are as extreme as some of their politics may show. It's because people who are supporting them are doing it as a protest because they're angry, because they see the failure of government to respond to the needs of the people. And you see it on the left, too, with the socialists from Vermont you know, leading in New Hampshire by 20 points. And I use those examples because I think people are getting disgusted. Um, we see governmental agencies that are supposed to regulate um, certain applicants instead manipulate and twist the system to try to benefit those applicants. And we've seen just in our own few years applicants' names changing from being called applicants to regulated entities to customers. And you know, the old saying is the customer is always right. The problem is that they are not always right and that governmental agencies are supposed to be the referee, to look at the facts, to look at the implications, to look at the laws and the regulations, and not to go out there and be a contortionist to try to benefit and to push through projects uh, that may not fit the rules, and in fact, we think do not fit the rules. And I think that's you know, why I'm here today, because it's really up to this commission who was appointed to represent the public, whose purpose is to implement the Pinelands Preservation Act, not the Pinelands Pipeline Act, whose purpose is to give, and has done, a remarkable job over decades with political pressure from different sources and different administrations to stand up for the Pinelands and to show the kind of integrity that you've all shown, especially when you have done that. And I'll use the example, even though it was a nasty battle, but when you had the 7-7 vote, that showed that the system worked. Um, you know, even if it went one way or the other, it showed the system worked because there was, a, there was scrutiny, there was a debate, um, people put issues on the table, and you responded. Either way you voted, you did your job. Um, but now, we're seeing two major pipeline developments that are being interpreted in a way 
to get around your influence and your input and your oversight and your review and your scrutiny. And that is really why I'm here today, because that is really my concern. Uh, people are allowed to have their opinion, but governmental agencies um, have to look at the facts. You cannot have your own set of facts. So I just wanted to go through a couple quickly, because I know other people want to speak. But I'll, I'll start off with South Jersey Gas. It had been considered just a year ago a project that didn't serve the fine ones, and that it was not a private development. Now it is. It's a public utility. It gets special rights under the law. It is not a private development. This is not, you know, somebody building a, you know, a, you know, a private company building a, or even building and putting in a, you know, sand and gravel operation. This is not that. It's a public utility with special benefits under the law. That the pipeline serves the pines. When at the Board of Public Utilities, the major purpose of it is to service for resiliency Atlantic and Cape May counties. That's not just the pines. It's supposed to service BL England. Okay, but if it's a private pipeline for a private development, then the ratepayers shouldn't be the ones paying for it. And that's New Jersey law, but yet the ratepayers are being paid for it. So by that definition alone, it is not a private development for private purpose. Then it comes back that BL England is going to be serving residents of the Pinelands in Atlanta County when that's completely false. And the reason is because it's a merchant plant that's going to bid into the grid and go into the spot market that BL England is needed for reliability for the region. We're in a region that the PJM shows is losing energy need and use, and that's why PSCNG Salem wants to send another a power line over the river to send power to, elect to Pennsylvania and Maryland. It's, you know, and, and it just goes on and on like that, and, and that's really the concern um, you know, that we have. Um, that we need to power in New Jersey. We have four plants. Another one last month broke ground, C. Warren 7, that are put going online. We've got 24 gigawatts going online in the next couple of years in the grid. This plant's not necessary. It hasn't even been into the auction. And, and it goes on and on like that, that oh, it's going to reduce pollution when that's false because it's going from a peaking plant that operates 60 days a year to one that's going to operate 24-7. And again, false because the amount of the amount of pollution coming out of just that increase is going to be about 500 times 500 percent greater than the current. Um, and then we get to New Jersey natural gas, and I don't know what happened. Uh, I'm not here to cast aspersions on anybody. I mean, I think that there needs to be an investigation into the Department of Defense um, because you don't all of a sudden take a pipeline that's going through a preservation area, which would raise a lot of issues and then all of a sudden bring it onto a base where there's homeland security issues and a whole range of other things and, and limits the use on the base itself uh, because of safety and security issues. Um, but again, you know, this is not a pipeline that's for resiliency or reliability. It's when you go through the facts and the documents of New Jersey Natural Resources, this is about bringing in a gas line for new development along the coast and for places like Heritage Minerals. Um, and so what we see here is spin and misinformation by applicants being taken as fact by agencies that then give their opinions without actually having any facts to back them up. And I think that's what's causing this crisis that we see in government. And what I ask for the commission to do, as I asked last month, is to put a stop on these applications until there are independent reviews and investigations, and until this commission gets to scrutinize what's happening uh, behind the scenes. You know, we found out, you know, that a member of the governor's staff, who was married to a uh, head of, S, you know, SJ Industries, was sending emails of what was going on on meetings within the governor's office on applicants in front of this commission. We've seen a whole range of other things going on, and I'd like to know what's going on with DOD because something there does not seem right. Um, and so I really would hope that this commission looks at at least putting a freeze on these two applications until there's independent review. And so you as commissioners have a right to bring these applications up and review them to make sure everything is going according to oil. I think that this is a body that has 
that role and that authority and that has that integrity and has the support of the public. And please do your job and do that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Marty Meister Jackson, Sierra Club, Ocean County. Um, the last time I was here, I had talked about the pipelines that are coming through New Jersey that are planned. Um, I, it's kind of difficult because South Jersey Gas isn't the only company besides um, New Jersey Natural Gas. Um, they are, they're advertising Penn East. All this stuff is coming to county from the fracking area industry over from Pennsylvania. I'm working on pipeline projects, I'm working on ocean projects, on Barnegat Bay and so on. I'm constantly working and absorbing the facts. Um, there was there, there are demonstrations and this has been in the works for quite some time. Um, that um, there are plans to build a liquid natural gas port out in the ocean that's on floats. It's not constructed permanently, but it's on float. Because now they claim this is liberty, whatever, um, they want to um, so and import natural gas so that they have a pipeline under water along the coast to feed gas to New York. Um, Penn East consists of six different utility companies coming from Pennsylvania. Um, I would suggest that we take a real close look because there is a groundswell in this state against anyone who is building or planning uh, pipelines for natural gas. Gas, the federal government is leasing um, plants, plots out in the ocean for um, um, a wind farm. And that is much cleaner than, than and it provides more jobs than um, any of those pipelines. Uh, Penn East advertises on the radio every few hours that it would, the pipeline for Penn East would bring in 12,000 jobs. Well, uh, with the Keystone XL pipeline from Canada to the, the center of the United States, and they had claimed at one time and that it would bring down 100,000, uh, would provide 100,000 jobs. But strangely enough, the original of this pipeline had said, no, no, it's not true. It's only about 6,500 at the most, only during the construction. So we really need to be very careful of what is being proposed and what is behind all this. Um, the investors for the liquid national port, national gas port, um, want to keep quiet. They don't want to be named. Um, they apparently have a, a management company in um, Canada, Trident, but their investment investors come from the Cayman Islands. They don't want to be mentioned. We don't know what they are, who they are, or anything like that. Um, it's great. We need to be put, I mean, New Jersey is just a small sliver of a state compared to Oklahoma or, or any of the other, or Texas. We cannot be overrun with gas, uh, gas pipeline. If there's an accident, they are all going to blow up. And how can we protect the citizens of New Jersey from what they, I mean, and I'm not supposed to mention this, uh, but it does happen all over the country, is homegrown terrorism. And, and you know, um, South Jersey Gas had said, oh, well, we will monitor these pipeline, this pipeline, um, yeah, 24 hours, seven days a week. I don't want to get into detail because I'm not an expert on shooting and, and blowing things up but it needs to be addressed. To do the negotiations uh, about the CMP with the, with the BPU and so on, it really, 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 if I was a commissioner in your position, I would feel insulted because you're being excluded from, finally from the, uh, from the decision. 
that Ms. Wittenberg is trying to negotiate with the BPU. Um, um, it, it's, it's unbelievable. Like I said, there is a groundswell of opposition to these guidelines. And we have collected petitions over and over and over for all these pipelines. We can. If Pennsylvania wants to export their gas and they want to bring it to New York, then let them go through New York and not, not here. Not New Jersey. And we nearly have to go after the, again, our governor and our, um, our representatives. Um, every legislature, uh, a person of the legislature here in New Jersey, along the shore, Monmouth County and Ocean County and, and, and so on, has opposed the um, liquid natural gas port. But then again, they can be bought off to, you know. I mean, it can be, can be circumvented. So we nearly have to be careful of what we're planning, okay? So, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. My name is Ann Kelly, of course, and i um, just a citizen, but I believe pipelines do not serve the fine lines. New Jersey, the country, or the world, and climate change is real. And to say that it isn't or to not include it in how it affects the fine lines is wrong. Um, there are also maybe a toxic plume problem on the base or near the military base where the proposed route, pipeline route, is there. So that will also impact the, uh, the, pi the pipeline. Uh, additionally, when you have any kind of military actions near a, an explosive type high pressure pipeline, I would imagine that would create a problem as for the safety. But in addition, I believe that there has been knowledge of a toxic waste area where the pipeline will be going um, or near it. And so that will create another problem, and it's near the military base. Um, I, I don't know um, the details of it, but I understand that someone from who happened to be in the military acknowledged that there is indeed a toxic uh, plume there. So adding insult to injury, we're putting pipelines which are explosive in an area where it's already dangerous and that hasn't been remediated to begin with. Um, I just don't find, it's just not even, it doesn't have any common sense here that we're continuing to to uh, go forward with a system that is not uh, good for the future of our, not only New Jersey, but our planet. Um, and we're looking at a mass extinction, not only of the, the world as we know it, but perhaps even us. Pending that 
inquiry, the applicant would be put on hold. The application needs to be just shelved and until facts can be found. So that's, that's, that's with respect to the earlier testimony we heard. Um, I had a couple points I want to make. Touch on four points very quickly. Um, with the Pope, the Pope's wake gone, and the Paris conference upcoming on climate, international conference, is going to put the climate issue again in the public, right up front and center in the public debate. What better time is it for the commission to say we're going to amend the CMP to incorporate climate policies and energy? Previously gave you the scientific rationale for that. I previously pointed to the Adirondack Park Agency who's done something similar with their land use authorities to build in energy and climate policies in their land use reviews. I pointed to where you've had statutory authority under the Ponds Act to do it. And today I just want to connect the dots on your existing CMP as to why it obligates you, frankly, to do it. The air quality section of the CMP talks about um, this general air quality standard. And it talks about meeting the air quality standards that the DEP has adopted in accordance with NJAC 7 colon 27. If you go to NJ 7 colon 27, you find that there are two types of air quality standards. And there's a general air quality standard. Just like you have a general and a specific, they have a general and a specific. So, and then the third prong of the connecting the dots there is to look at the state's 2005 adoption of rules that now define CO2 as a air contaminant. So you've got the regulatory ducks in line. You have a scientific rationale, and it's all linked to your CMP. And, and it's a politically opportune time to make a public statement and get out of all the negativity we're in and do something positive for a change. Instead of spending staff time on working with applicants to get pipelines to the pondlands, we could try to do something good. So that's my appeal to reason. Um, secondarily, the second point is uh, with respect to the moratorium that Mr. Tittle mentioned, I had mentioned it previously. Uh, the news report of the September 11th commission meeting said the executive director said that they would require an AG's review. Have you have you asked for that formally? Have you referred it to the AG's office to ask for uh, a legal opinion as to with, with respect to whether the commission has authority to adopt a moratorium? <coughs> I don't believe that the request was for a formal opinion. I believe that the commission asked Mr. Moriarty to <coughs> and to provide I believe Mr. Moriarty is, is willing to do so in closed session today. <laughs> Again, the difference here is that formally there's opinion. We have it in writing. It's legally uh, the position of the Attorney General's office, and it's transparent. I can read it. What you discussed in the executive session, I have no idea. And I have no ab ability to influence your analysis. So, <coughs> secondarily, I would mention DRBC has a moratorium on fracking. They obviously have the administrative authority. I haven't reviewed their underlying legal basis, but I have looked at the Pilots Act. I'm not an attorney, but you clearly have both authority to adopt bylaws as to how the commission operates, and you have regulatory authority. And if you mix bylaws and regulatory authority, you clearly have the sufficient legal power to adopt an administrative moratorium. And final point on that is that the U.S. Supreme Court has upheld the legality of, of administrative moratoriums in, in the pendency of, of developing a regional plan for adequate protection of natural resources in the Lake Tahoe case. So you have all the all the bells and whistles there. And you know, again, I appeal to your better side to do the right thing. And now you've got this negative stuff going on that there's possibly impropriety or fraud in submission of the application, which further justifies uh, some form of administrative halt. Um, third point is um, and I'm not here to cast aspersions either. I'm here to hold people accountable. You have management issues. This is not the first time where there's been direct conflict between an applicant's written statements and the staff's uh, public statements. And we can go back and roll back the tape to where we had this conversation with respect to the, my objection and the public's objection to the pre-application process on the South Jersey gas application, that it was not transparent that commitments were being made to the applicant that the public had no opportunity to be aware of or participate in, and that I think even there was a tape recording of the commission deliberating on this question. So 
that was, you know, as far as I'm concerned, at that point, you should have said, you know, the public raised some valid points there. We have some issues of appearance, if not actual problems. Let's set up a process where we make the pre-application conferences transparent, meaning we put it up on the website. We say who we met with, who was there, what issues were discussed, what, <coughs> what uh, documents were shared, and what the next step is, and what the uh, consensus or technical agreements are. That, that's what needs to happen. And that didn't happen. So that's all water over the dam. But we're seeing the same thing again. Now, I have to file an Oprah. I have to come in and do a file review to see whether or not, in fact, the administrative record reflects the um, statements of staff with respect to what went on during those pre-application hearings with New Jersey natural gas. It shouldn't be this way. You shouldn't have the media reporting statements that conflict with your executive director statements. That's just, a, 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 just like totally bad. For the commission, it's bad for the public. It's bad, it shouldn't happen. So, so at any rate, that was just one of the concerns. The, 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 the mold process, the South Jersey gas mold process. South Jersey gas asserts in writing, and it's on their website, that the idea for a MOA was recommended by the commission staff. And they put that in writing. The commission staff says, we don't know. We have no paper trail. The same issue with respect to the finding that the, that the South Jersey gas project was inconsistent with the forest standards. I called it the uh, immaculate finding. There's no paper trail on it. How could that be? How could there not be a document that says staff has determined this pipeline is inconsistent with the forest standards when the whole process was structured around that finding? And South Jersey gas now denies it ever happened. Again, we're in, a, in, in a, an amazing management issue. Where it, stuff like that in basic government management 101 should not happen. The, the, the Lloyd matter, the Lloyd recusal matter, there was the New York Times, there were conflicting statements in the New York Times about whether or not the governor's office was, was a part of the process of recusal. And subsequently to that, after it was denied by your staff, emails came out that were disclosed that showed direct real time communications with the governor's office on the, on the white recusal matter. That should have been strike three. And here we are again in the same he said, she said debate about what went on. You know, that's a management issue. And I, I'll advise the, 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 the commission that under the Pinelands Act, the executive director serves at the pleasure of the Pinelands Commission, not the governor's office, the Pinelands Commission. She's your employee. You have management oversight of that. And you're letting that happen on a repeated basis, time and time again. And not some minor stuff about, you know, some after the fact discovery of some endangered plant. You're talking about major regional gas pipeline projects that are in, on the front page of the paper that hundreds of people are opposing. Municipal governments are opposing. And, and you're making basic errors on that. That, that's, that should be intolerable. Um, the final, the final point um, I have is the upcoming VP hearing, which it was not described adequately as to what that hearing is about and what the significance of that hearing is. That hearing is to preempt municipal <coughs> land use review under the land use law. It's a petition by South Jersey Gas to do that. And if you take that petition and VP grants that petition, given the way your, your uh, regs work with respect to your certificate of filing, you're going to have an agency, a DPU, serving the Pinelands Commission's review role that is formally, through the, through the private development process, essentially delegated to municipal governments, is now going to be taken over by a state agency. And it's not an independent state agency, it's a state agency that has, number one, no knowledge or expertise in the land use and Pinelands resources that you do, but number two is issued three orders, one, two, three, three orders supporting the project. So how is it possible that they could possibly have an independent review of a project that they've supported with through three orders? This is unbelievable to me that this is happening. And you're allowing it to happen because you haven't stepped in and said, we object to this project being designated a private development application, and we object to, this, to the reversal of the prior <coughs> staff finding which found this pipeline inconsistent with the forest standards. And all, if all you would need to do is say those two magic words, that we want the prior staff finding to be honored, 
And then the applicant would have to go through his only other regulatory option, which you, Chairman, identify in a, in a wonderful letter to the uh, Atlantic City Press, saying that the two options are a MOA or a, a, a waiver of strict compliance. And let's get back to basics. Let's follow the rules. The rules are for everybody. And that applicant should have to go through a waiver of strict compliance process. That's his only option. And we all know this. And the commission should step up and say, that's the way the regs read. That's the way the CMP works. We object to the executive director usurping our review authority and extinguishing the public's ability to comment. Simple motion. Make the motion. Make it happen. Fix the problem that exists. Thank you. Thank you. Next, uh, Natalie Rice. Thank you, Good morning. Um, my name is Natalie Nice. I uh, reside in Petersburg, Upper Township. Um, I was previously in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, involved in land planning uh, to save the agriculture land. And um, I have worked with a surveyor in, um, south, at the South Jersey Shore. Um, this is my first time here, and I need to know um, what you can do for me. Um, I have gone to upper township meetings such as planning, zoning, committee, and more. I personally had a 1991 subdivision um, in upper township. And um, during these meetings, like upper township committee, the uh, solicitor has told me that they don't have to know about the pipeline, um, that I should take my questions to the BPU. Um, <coughs> And recently, I spoke two days ago with um, Paul Dietrich, our township engineer, and I wanted to see the specs on the pipeline. Uh, he doesn't even have the up-to-date specs. He doesn't know about the pipe. He couldn't explain. He told me to take down the numbers and, you know, go find out. Um, we also talked about um, that there's changes that he didn't have at his fingertips <coughs> about the valving stations and the interconnect stations in um, Tuckahoe. And um, I said, I thought there was a resolution. He said, well, it's not really a resolution. I said, I thought they were paying $67,500. He said, no, um, it's going to be an easement. And um, he basically told me if I didn't like it, just go run an election. Um, I also know, living in that community, um, that Sam Fiocchi, our assemblyman, came down and went knocking door to door and told people that they'd be able to hook up to this pipeline. And in talking to um, gas people driving around, I was told that there's a difference between a two inch line, a three inch line, a six inch plastic coated line, and a 24 inch transmission line. So, um, I think that was very misleading. Um, I also um, filed an, an OPA request the other day with Upper Township to get the deed to this property that, that they um, hold um, where they want to put this valley station where the ball fields are um, that used to be school buildings dating back previous 1950. And, um, I didn't get their written letter yet, but they're telling me that they don't have a deed. And I might not be able to get it because it could have been a foreclosure. So, as far as I know, that's been public property for a long time. And I have this um, article that I read in the Ocean City Sentinel, which is the paper that gets put in our yard once a week, dated October 7th. And the headline says, Public Hearings on Gas Pipeline Set for October 19th. Two public hearings on the potential conversion of the coal power BL England generating station to natural gas are scheduled for Monday, October 19th at the Upper Township Municipal Building. And then it goes on to the second page where it says, The BPU applied for memorandum of agreement for the proposed pipeline. In August, Nancy Wittenberg, Pinelands Commission Executive Director, announced that a Pinelands 
commission meeting that a certificate of filing was granted for the proposed pipeline. Is this true? Um, a certificate of filing is commonly sent to applicants, commonly sent to applicants for private development, according to the Pinelands Commission. I mean, what does this mean? I mean, is there something that like Sam Fioki knows that you know the rest of us don't know? I mean, people in Upper Township they really want gas there because they believe that it's cheaper than oil. So um, I, I don't know. I find this um, article very confusing about the hearing on the 19th. As a matter of fact, um, it conflicts with uh, a state of New Jersey Board of Utilities. Um, document here um, where they're quoting NJSA 4055D-19 and um, I happened to go to a township zoning meeting last night. It was short and quick, over within less than an hour. I mean, I, he said public had comments and closed it so fast I didn't have a chance. But I asked um, the people after the meeting, like, what do they know about home rule and are they going to this meeting on the 19th? They flat out told me they didn't know about the meeting on the 19th. They hadn't read the paper yet. They didn't know what I was talking about when I said home rule. Only one of them appeared to know. And the um, chairman of the meeting said he couldn't talk to me because um, something might come before him and he didn't want to hear that I was opposed to the pipeline. So again, you know, I'd like to know what you all can do for me. And I would really like to understand if, if you can all explain, because to me this article is really confusing. And I don't know really what I expect, you know, in going to this hearing on the 19th. And I understand I can't go to the one on the 21st in Trenton, the evidentiary hearing. And I did happen to go to the one last June, and they held that at the community hall and they combined the public comment with an evidentiary hearing. And that was really confusing for just people in the community to understand and sit there. I mean, one hearing ran from three o'clock into six o'clock, seven o'clock, and they had all their professionals there. There was very little time really for just a regular person to ask questions or even know what a public hearing was about at that time. Ms. Nice. could I recommend that uh, if you like at your meeting, uh, if, if the director would agree, perhaps you could sit down uh, with one of our staff and ask your specific questions, and then maybe they can help you. I'm not sure I'm following what exactly what the questions are, but we may be able to uh, give you some answers the first day. Okay, I appreciate that, but I think openly, I mean, this says here, you know, uh, that. She, a certificate of filing is commonly sent to applicants for private development. I mean, is issue it, a certificate of filing, and, and I'm sure that can be explained to you. We but how is it a private, I mean, this South Jersey gas, because they're private? Is that how you, you're doing this? Not because they're private. What I'd like to do is have the staff address your questions for you, but not necessarily now, right now, there are other people who are still doing it. Speaking. We've had a number of public discussions about this. Uh, so perhaps that would help if they, if they could talk with you directly. The director's offering to do that. Well, have you seen the article? Do you think it's misleading? I have not seen the article you're referring to. I know it's not misleading to say a certificate of filing was issued because it was. And the staff can explain that to you. So this hearing is about the potential conversion of the oil power Beal England plan. That's your understanding of the hearings on the 19th? Yes. No. 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 Well, it's about the pipeline that would lead to the conversion. Of the, if the pipeline were installed. Maybe, could, could you tell me publicly what, what your understanding is of the hearings on the 19th? I see her nodding her head. So you would come after the public comment in here? I mean, I don't know how long I can stay. She could just tell me quickly what her understanding is of the hearing on the 19th. So the, it's, um, I think it was Bill Wolf who talked about it. It's 4055D. It's a provision in the um, state of 
state municipal land use law that allows public utilities. Um, we have public infrastructure projects, and this is by summarizing it, they have to be precisely right. Do not have to go to each municipality for their approval, they can go to the Board of Public Utilities. And this hearing is on an application that might have even called a petition because BPU uses different language than us for that. Okay, and that's if they've been aggrieved. No, no grievance or no. This is the hearing for that process. But they can go there if they feel they've been aggrieved. Anybody can go. And it's open to the public. Open to the public, anybody can go. Okay, thank so you. Everybody can go. Thank you. It's okay. Uh, Mary Ackerman. Mary Ackerman, good morning. Um, I found myself here again after surgery, after eye surgery, um, and not wanting to come to this meeting today, but I pushed myself to come because I, it's that important to me. Um, at the last meeting, I, I stated to you folks that you all took an oath to preserve and protect the pine land. And I actually became a couple of minutes late, so I don't know if you addressed this issue that was brought up at the last meeting about um, whether or not you, as the Pine Lands Commission, why couldn't you? Hello? Why couldn't you have a, a hearing? Because I think because of all the public comment that was going on about the fact that this project was approved as a private entity, and I don't see any reason why Ms. Wittenberg can't explain how South Jersey Gas can be considered a private entity. There is no provision at CMP for a public hearing at the Finance Commission for that kind of application. That's a short answer. Yeah, but how is South Jersey Gas? able to be considered a private entity when they are a public utility. It's, it's provided in the comprehensive management plan for this type of application. They have filed it. And but they have filed it as a private entity. How can they be considered a private entity if they are a public they're not, utility? They're not a private entity and they have not filed as a private entity. They, it's called a private development application. It's not a reflection of their status. Um, sounds like monkey talk to me. <laughs> I mean, your answer sounds like monkey talk to me. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. That's it, it. I'm only telling you it's in the it's in the coverage of that. There. But do you realize that you're, what's the purpose of this commission? You know, if you're not, um, if you are taken out of the equation of approving this pipeline, that is a major um, situation. Now, if you're talking about private development, if that's, you know, in the, in the comprehensive management agreement um, plan, is that private development probably meant for small landowner kind of development that the whole commission wouldn't have to be involved with. If that's the case, then this is a total misrepresentation of what private development is on the part of South Jersey Gas. Yes, Mr. Chairman, maybe, maybe I can shed a little bit of light on, on the topic that's being discussed. Uh, as we mentioned, uh, before in our discussions, there are public development applications that are followed, filed by public agencies, and there are private development applications. And that are filed by? Okay. Just let me finish, okay. and I'll be glad to answer any questions you have. Uh, and our regulations lay out a path for private development application and public development applications. Public development applications are filed by public agencies, and I can go through all of our regulations uh, because it would take too long, but uh, they are in our in our rules, and the 
a private entity that, oh, excuse me, I lost my train of thought there for a moment. So a public development application is typically filed by a municipality, a county, a state agency. Those are all public development applications, and you vote on those applications at your monthly meetings. Private development applications. Private development applications are typically residential subdivision, commercial development. They receive a certificate of filing. They do not make their way to the commission. That's a private development process. When you're dealing with utility companies, utility companies include water companies, electric companies, gas companies. Those, the commission since 1981 has viewed those as private companies that are filing private development applications and has issued certificates of filing for those companies. I'm glad to answer any follow-up questions. Well, I, I, <clears throat> if that's the case, how come South Jersey Gas came in with a, an MOA at the beginning and not come through with a private development application? It was an all, also available to them as an approach to, to seek approval for that project. Well, I will go through BPO. It, yeah. it, it still is, you know, I think Mr. Rasmussen brought up valid, valid points. You, you people on the commission need to do your job. You need to look into your hearts and your consciences, and you need to do what, what's right for this this uh, pine lands. And and all the commissioners doing their jobs. And if you recall from the last meeting, uh, at the closing meeting where we take the commissioner comment, Commissioner Ashman uh, made the request to the executive director to exercise her discretion recognize that under these private development applications, the director has the discretion to refer the matter to the commission. If she chooses the board to exercise herself and join that request. So, so what was sure the result of that request? There's, there's, there's been, it's, the thing has changed. The application is still moving forward, okay? So I don't know what you're asking of the commission, you know? Uh, the, the so, so Commissioner Ashman and yourself asked that the that the executive director um, refer this to the commission, and the executive director has now refused to do that. The director has not refused. Oh, so what has happened? It's in abeyance right now. There's nothing being done. It's in process. What does that mean? That means the application is moving forward, and the BPU hearing is scheduled, and. You know as much as you know. no, but handing it over to the commission, which would be the right thing to do, uh, I think, to be able to have the commission evaluate this application, which is really the same application that happened in 2014. So, you, you guys got to look into your heart and your consciences and do the right thing. I don't know how to follow up on that. Um, it seems to me that the commission, I, I, and I've only been coming to these meetings for the last couple of years, so it seemed to me that the commission had the overall authority of projects coming through the pine lands. Mm -hmm. And in this one case, that, that has kind of been taken away from you. N now, there now, have been many private applications. I'm, I'm sure, but this didn't start out that way, right? This did not start out as a private application. And for, now this company's found a way around the rule because they lost in the first application. They lost the vote. And, you know, look, I, I mean, I understand you all have a job to do, as, as does the executive director, but the job here is to preserve and protect the Pinelands. There's no other reason to exist. So the fact that we're here again about this project is just, it's, um, it's really kind of surprising to me. And, and to say, to reiterate what uh, Jeff Tittle said, we are losing confidence in our, in our governmental, our commissions, because you, we've come here, you've heard expert testimony, and it just basically got ignored. And I think that that's, you know, that, that's something we, should, we really need to take into account. 
We have this small little corner of the earth. You are stewards of that corner of the earth. It is your job to protect it. And I just ask that you, uh, I, I would ask the, commit, the executive director to put the application before the commission again. I think that that would be a, a wise thing to do. And then however the vote goes, it goes. Thank you. Marilyn Miller from Tom's River again. <laughs> I'm not here to crack jokes and be eloquent. I'm here to support you in the original mission to preserve and protect. <clears throat> I didn't want to come inside because it was so beautiful outside and one of the commissioners was coming in and I said, I don't want to be inside. I like the pine lands. I was out there kayaking on the waiting yesterday. <sighs> I'm outside listening to the birds outside. My Irish immigrant ancestors came to America because they lost their land, tyranny and greed. And my bud ancestors came for the same reason, to America. And we have a commission. We. We the people. So I am also here to support your mission to preserve the protection. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members. My name is Doug O'Malley. I'm the Executive Director of Environment New Jersey. We represent more than 20,000 citizen members across this great state. And I just wanted to say, listening to the testimony this morning, I'm reminded why uh, I'm so thankful to have so many active citizens who are, are here coming out and testifying month after month after month. And I'm also thankful uh, for, for the commission and, and for uh, its members and, and for you, Mr. Chairman, to be able to engage in a, an open dialogue, uh, which quite frankly should, should not be unusual uh, in New Jersey and, and is. Um, there's, there's a lot to say this morning. Um, but I wanted to say in summary that there's a clear crisis in confidence in the application process for the Pinelands Commission. And specifically in the emails that Mr. Rasmussen uh, referred to and reported in, in uh, WHY uh, yesterday, that, you know, this cannot, you know, this cannot be a moment where the Pinelands Commission looks the other way. Uh, there's been a clear attempt to subvert the process uh, not only of the commission, but of the comprehensive management plan, and you know that's uh, you know that that cannot be ignored. Um, and I wanted to, to kind of take a, a moment here because obviously those emails uh, and those conversations regard one applicant and one uh, project, although albeit a very large one, uh, going through the forest management area. It, clearly, what we've seen here at the commission is part of a uh, part of a global issue not only for the comprehensive management plan, but more broadly in how our citizenry and the public interact with government. And it's a tension, I think, that's as old as the republic, as old as government in some ways, and that's the need for transparency. And obviously, uh, you know, public officials, you know, we are coming up on an election. I, it's expected to have the lowest turnout in New Jersey history. The primary election this last June had 5% the New Jersey populace turnout. Uh, people vote with their feet, and right now they're voting by by not <laughs> by not voting. And when we kind of look at, at why people are turning away from politics, it, it starts a generation ago with the Watergate hearings. But more accurately, in this era, it starts in private and public at this point. Thanks. Uh, at this time, I understand the two had a matter of closed session. Mr. Moyer, I'm just 
just want to know what your thoughts are on the Chinese Communist Party and the Chinese Communist Party.